Welcome back to the deep dive, everybody. You know, we like to get into it on this show. We like to pick a topic, something that's maybe kind of controversial and really get under the hood. Today, it's Scientology and specifically its connections with narcissism. Yeah, we're going to be kind of pulling back the curtain, looking at how those two things, you know, Scientology and narcissism, how they kind of intertwine. Right. And not just in terms of like the organization itself, but maybe some stuff that you see out in the world, too, you know. Like, could be helpful for your own life, too. Right? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we've got some really fascinating material to work with today. We've got excerpts from this article. It goes really in-depth on some of the core practices of Scientology. And we've also got these two videos from a former Scientologist, Davey Miscavige. Oh, wow. And let me tell you, he does not hold back. I bet. So are these, like, tell-all expose kind of things? What are we working with? Oh, yeah. It's juicy, but it's also like, you know, when you hear something and it just clicks, yeah. like it explains so much about how these systems work, especially when you bring narcissism into it. Right. Yeah. So I guess our mission today is to kind of give everyone listening their own little toolkit. Yeah. You know, like a how to spot narcissism starter pack. Exactly. Because it's not just about like big organizations. It's everywhere. Right. It's the uh, the boss who's always taking credit for your work. It's that friend who like always has to be this center of attention oh totally mm -hmm. or even just like you know that pushy salesperson who just won't leave you alone yes <laughs> that's the one okay so how do we spot these people well this article uses this phrase and i'm going to quote it here fresh meat and it's talking about how they describe new recruits to scientology uh, right oh, like, yeah. that's not a good sign no. But it is kind of classic, you know, when you think about it. It's like they reel you in with this intense, over-the-top affection. Like love bombing. Yeah, they're telling you you're special, you're brilliant, you're destined for greatness. All that jazz, yep. It's textbook narcissism. You see that pattern so often, that whole idealization, and then boom, the devaluation. Which the article gets into as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're on this high, right? You're feeling amazing about yourself, and then suddenly the rug is pulled out. Okay, so how does that happen? What's the shift? Well... You start to get this sense that you're not quite good enough. Like you have to keep proving yourself. Anytime you express any doubt, any kind of resistance, you're met with this intense pressure to conform. And I'm guessing they don't like it if you question anything. Oh, no. You get hit with these labels, potential trouble source, or even worse, suppressive person. Which is basically like Scientology excommunication, right? Bingo. They want to isolate you, make you dependent on them for approval. So they control the narrative, control the information you're getting. Classic power move. And it gets even creepier. Davey talks about this whole system of snitching mm -hmm. within Scientology. Wait, seriously? Like telling on each other? Oh, yeah. But it's not just casual gossip. Like, they actively encourage members to report on each other, especially if someone's expressing doubts about the organization. Even to family? Even family. Wow. That's messed up. And what does that achieve? I mean, what's the point of creating that kind of atmosphere? Control, plain and simple. It's about instilling this constant fear, this paranoia that someone's always watching you. So you don't even dare to think a thought that goes against their doctrine. Exactly. And Davey's very clear about who benefits from this whole system. He says, and I quote, David Miscavige is using the snitch network to stay in power. So it's all about maintaining power. But if their message is so great, why do they need to resort to these tactics? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. And it gets to the heart of what Davey calls the narcissistic enterprise of Scientology. And he's not holding back. Nope. He says how he sees it. And, you know, when you look at the classic traits of narcissism, mm. grandiosity, lack of empathy, exploitative behavior, it's hard to argue with them, honestly. I mean, you don't get to be the leader of a controversial organization like that without some shall we say, strong personality traits. Mm -hmm. Right. And that grandiosity, it's everywhere. Like they claim to be the fastest growing religion, but the data just doesn't support that. It's like they have this need to project this image of being this huge influential force, even if it's not entirely accurate. And if you question it, well, then you're the problem. You're the one who's not getting it. It's never them. It's always you. And that kind of ties into this whole thing of like, controlling your reality, doesn't it? Totally. It's like they're trying to create this bubble where their version of truth is the only one that matters. And that lack of empathy, it plays out in some pretty disturbing ways, according to Davey. He talks about this disconnection policy they have. Yeah. 
the article mentions that too, like basically being forced to cut ties with anyone who criticizes Scientology. Even family. It's brutal. They'll literally pressure you to choose between your family and the church. It's like they think they have the right to dictate who you can and can't have in your life. Exactly. And then there's the fair game policy, which is basically their license to target anyone they consider an enemy. Oh, right. It's like their version of all's fair in love and war. But in this case, it's more like... All's fair in Scientology. Pretty much. They can spread lies, dig up dirt, even harass people, all in the name of protecting the church. And it's all justified because anyone who criticizes them is automatically labeled an enemy. Which just proves Davy's point about the fragile ego. Yeah. Right? Like, any little criticism, they totally freak out. They can't handle it. It's yeah. like beneath that veneer of confidence and certainty, there's this deep-seated insecurity. It's kind of sad, actually. Like, imagine being so afraid of criticism that you have to resort to those kinds of tactics. Davey actually talks about this really interesting example. He says that Scientologists will go to crazy lengths to avoid protesters, like covering their faces, wearing masks, the whole nine yards. Wow, like they're trying to hide from the truth. Exactly. And it's like, what are they so afraid of? It all circles back to control, right? Right. If they can control the information, control the narrative, then they can maintain this illusion of power and perfection. And if that illusion is shattered, even for a second, game over. Exactly. And that need for control, it can manifest in some pretty exploitative ways, which unfortunately is something we also see within Scientology. Right. Like, Davey talks specifically about the treatment of children and members of the Sea Org. Yeah, they're the ones who sign those billion-year contracts, basically dedicating their lives to the church, and often working incredibly long hours under really intense conditions. And let's not forget the allegations of abuse. It's all pretty disturbing stuff. It really makes you question the whole system, doesn't it? Like, how can an organization that claims to be about love and compassion justify that kind of treatment? It's like their need for control trumps any sense of human decency. And what's scary is that it's not just confined to Scientology. Oh, absolutely. We see these same patterns play out in all sorts of groups and relationships. That controlling partner, that manipulative boss, that friend who always needs to be the center of attention, it's all connected. It really is. Yeah. And it kind of feels like the million dollar question here, you know? Yeah. Like if we can spot it in Scientology, can we use that knowledge to help us in our own lives? Yeah. I mean, that's the hope, right? That we can learn from these things, even if it's just to protect ourselves. Absolutely. So, like, practically speaking, what are some red flags to look out for? Well, it's tricky because it's not always obvious, right? Narcissists can be incredibly charming, charismatic. Right. They can be really good at making you feel special, at least at first. Exactly. So you have to, like, listen to your gut. If something feels off, even if you can't quite put your finger on it, trust that instinct. Yeah. Don't ignore those red flags. And don't be afraid to ask questions even if it means challenging someone in a position of authority. Oh, that's so important. Don't let anyone make you feel bad for wanting clarification or setting boundaries. Right. Boundaries are huge. It's about knowing your worth and what you're willing to tolerate. Which, let's be real, is probably a lot less than we often put up with. Yeah, probably. But it's a learning process, right? The more we understand about these patterns, the easier it becomes to recognize them and protect ourselves. Totally. Well, I'd say this has been quite the deep dive. We covered a lot of ground. We did. From love bombing to snitching to billion-year contracts, it's a lot to process. It really is. But hopefully our listeners are walking away with a little more awareness, you know. And a little healthier skepticism. Exactly. So, next time you encounter a group, or even just a person who seems a little too good to be true, remember what we talked about today. Trust your gut. Ask questions. And don't be afraid to walk away if something doesn't feel right. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for joining us on another deep dive. Until next time. Stay curious, everyone.